Can you do that? Yes. Okay. Just point. My budget stuff, so I don't see those again, right? Now. Oh, yes, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, great. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else need one? Okay, so I think uh, if everybody's good, um, it's 701. So I'd like to call to order the uh, regular meeting of the Board of for uh, Monday, January 22nd. Um, please all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, moving on to item number three, no real update um, from my side, except I'm, um, it'll be interesting. I'm going to actually go on a tour of some affordable housing, uh, different projects, not projects, but, you know, uh, projects going on um, in the region. So the, our uh, council of government organized a bus tour, and so I'm kind of looking forward to that. Um, we have you know, Wellington and Madison, which was groundbreaking um, in December, um, which is really our first large affordable housing complex in a long time in town. And so it'd be interesting to see what other communities are doing. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but otherwise, no real updates. Obviously, we've had some weather events um, happening. Um, we we'll continue to uh, encourage people to sign up for Madison Alerts to get uh, weather updates um, and just be weary of, you know, uh, Things can change very quickly, and we, especially the storms we encountered last week with a lot of the flooding. Um, you know, it's important to stay in tune and understand what's going on in the town with road closures and things like that. So, just want to encourage people to do that. You can get more information about signing up on the town website. And with that, I'll turn on to other meetings and reports or selectmen's comments. I don't know if we have any meetings since our last. It's been a kind of compressed schedule, so yeah. nope. Nope. no, no updates on. Uh, I got to attend the Leonardo da Vinci opening at Scranton Memorial Libraries uh, this weekend, <laughs> which was pretty cool. I'm not going to lie. So if you haven't had a chance to get out there and check it out, it's for the children. But I think adults, uh, et cetera, myself, I got a little picture inside of Leonardo da, da Vinci's head. So that was pretty, <laughs> that was pretty cool. Um, so I would highly suggest checking it out um, with grandchildren, with children. Uh, it's a family event. It was very well done. Um, it's big. It's a lot bigger than I expected. So it's a lot of square feet in the library. So uh, it's pretty impressive. So we're, we're very lucky. Great. Any other? Nope. Not this one. Okay, good. Uh, so moving on, do we have any hands raised? Do we have any citizens comments online? Uh, well, first of all, here in the, uh, in the audience, any residents comments at all? No? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then if there's any hands raised online, Jeannie, do you see any? I do not. No hands raised. Okay, there's always an uh, opportunity for public comment at the end of the meeting as well. So um, so with that, I guess um, I'd like a, to make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Second. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Um, so item number seven, I would like to welcome up uh, a members of the Garden Club who are here tonight. We're here to issue a proclamation um, to celebrate their 100th anniversary, which oh. is incredible. So uh, we want to welcome you here tonight. Um, and what I'll do, I, I don't know, do you want to speak a little bit about the club or do you have any materials you want to talk about? Presentation? the proclamation says it all. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. <laughs> I don't know if there's a town crier or something. <laughs> Right. So I, what I will do is um, I'm going to make a motion to approve a proclamation for the 100th anniversary of the Garden Club of Madison. I'll give it a second and then I'll read the proclamation. Second. Okay, great. Well, <laughs> proclamation celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Garden Club of Madison. Whereas for 100 years, the Garden Club of Madison has been a vibrant and committed part of the community fabric. And whereas the Garden Club of Madison has endured through the decades, sharing the art, science, and pleasure of gardening, horticulture, and environmental conservation with the community. And whereas the Garden Club of Madison has enhanced the beauty of our community by developing and maintaining 
numerous perennial and seaside gardens and native plant walks throughout town. And whereas the Garden Club of Madison maintains the Veterans and 9-11 Memorial Gardens, and whereas the Garden Club of Madison is responsible for the planting of more than 20,000 daffodil bulbs throughout the town and continues to expand the daff daffodil trail initiative each year, and whereas the Garden Club of Madison manages the Bower Park apple orchard, its beehives and orchard expansion, and whereas the Garden Club of Madison exemplifies volunteerism and promotes a healthy lifestyle that lasts a lifetime, helps reduce stress from other areas of life, mm -hmm. and teaches that rewards can come from diligent efforts. And whereas the board gratefully recognizes the achievements of the Garden Club of Madison, on behalf of the town and the Board of Selectmen, I express our appreciation for the Garden Club of Madison's outstanding commitment to the town on its 100th anniversary. Now, therefore, we, the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Mad Madison, do hereby recognize the Garden Club of Madison's 100th anniversary dated at Madison, Connecticut, this 22nd day of January 2024. All in favor of approving the proclamation, say aye. 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 <laughs> so, with that, we have a uni unanimous approval of the proclamation, which Yay. we will present. Thank you. I know that you talked a bit about maybe taking some of the funding that you have to put it for a project that you can kind of put your stamp on more, mm -hmm. which I think is a great idea. Um, we're really appreciative of that and the donation that you're going to be supplying. And um, just excited to see, I, I forgot about the Daffodil Project. I know mm -hmm. I've seen those around town. Um, and certainly the uh, Memorial Gardens around Memorial Day and, and the 9-11 Memorial, those are all important central courts for the community. So we just love to keep our town beautiful and they do a great job doing that. So thank you for that. Um, and we, if you'd like, we can get a picture with the board if you want. And, yeah, uh, yeah, and I don't know if any of you would like to, you know, say a few words or don't feel you have to, but you're welcome to do that. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, so we can just do it in front of okay. here so we yes, cover up all our mess and, uh, and then Jeannie's just take a photo and take a couple. So. So come and join us. We'll try to get everybody in here. And uh, we'll all snuggle in. Yeah. And if you want to follow the we have a one. Right? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> I think I took enough. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Now you're all sponsored. Oh my God. It's amazing. Project. I'm sorry this didn't work out the way we thought, but I'm excited about the next phase. So, okay. Yeah, you want one with just Peggy and two of you? Same shirt. Okay. make sure we choose. get the Okay, great. And I will uh, email those to you and then take your pictures and we'll do a little town blast on it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peggy. Thank you so much. Appreciate all your work. Thanks, everybody. We're the founding members here. Okay. Um, that, that's going to be something we're going to have time. Okay. Yeah. They had a great sale that for year. I know. Thank you. 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 All right, so um, the next item on our agenda is an update from the Planning and Zoning Commission on our plan of consultation. So we have uh, our chair here, Carol Snow, and she was just going to walk through a, a, a little presentation on, you know, the POCD and the process that they're at right now. So, okay, great, thanks. I have a, a PowerPoint to share. Yeah, it's not letting me share. I don't know if that's because you took over. Um... I don't think oh, so. Oh, now, now we can. Okay. And I promise it's really quick, even oh, though it's a lot of slides. This is what's up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, 
Last time I was here to give you an update, I believe was in March 2023, and a lot has happened since then. Um, first of all, we are now a full commission of nine members, so thank you very much for that. Um, it's really exciting. We've got a great team, and so they've jumped into this plan of conservation and development full heartedly. Um, and in fact, I think it's great that they've taken ownership of it, as opposed to having us just outsource it to a, a consultant, which we do have a consultant and who will sort of put on all the finishing touches and really make sure we've checked all the boxes that we need for state um, requirements and regional requirements. At any rate, um, we've made a lot of progress and obviously a big impact to us was the strategic plan. And so um, we kind of put some of our, our movement forward on hold while we heard back from the community and back from you all to see how that took shape. And that was great. Um, and I think what we're coming up with is, is nicely aligned and complements well, and also reinforces the strategic plan. So we look forward to hearing back from you all on that when you have a chance to see um, a draft. So um, what we, what we, I think last time I talked to you, we had already decided what our basic themes were and that we had split um, into dividing it into the built environment and the natural environment. And we were just, I think, getting started on the natural environment. Now we've done both. And what became immediately obvious going through this whole process was how interrelated and interconnected they are. So this is actually, um, the PowerPoint I'm giving is was basically put together by Bob Reinhart, who's gotten very interested in helping combine all these different kind of policies and action items into a matrix using his business skills, which is fantastic to have that kind of skill set on the, on the commission, um, in a way that we've, we've kind of distilled it down to seven policies and action items. So we've gone from the previous plan of conservation and development had over 100 action items. We've gone down to um, seven policies and just over 30 action items, which will be adjusted, um, obviously, when we get more feedback from from stakeholders, but let me just, let's just, if we could just run through this quickly, Jean, I guess you, do I just ask you? Yeah, so here's what we've done so far. Um, you can see we're coming down to the home stretch of the conclusion and impl implementation guidelines. Okay, next slide. And I don't know if you can read that, but we've gone, you know, I'm giving you sort of an introduction, then we went through a community vision plan for the natural environment, the built environment, and then conclusion implementations. We've discussed a lot about vision goals themes and perspectives and policies and the vision and goals, I think was actually it was a really good exercise for us to be involved in some of the strategic planning to see how you define those and, and set parameters and what's important and how you prioritize. Okay, next. So here's just some of the terminology. We got to be more comfortable with vision goals, themes, policies, um, influenced by our perspectives, which are the natural and built environment and then action items. Okay, next. So I'm not gonna, I don't know if we want to read through all this, but the, we, we wanted to really have um, impactful statements about what our vision was. And, you know, we were kind of starting out all over, all over the map in a way and kind of collecting all these different ideas. And again, I think it helped us crystallize our thoughts by going through the strategic planning process to create a vision for the plan of conservation and development that we think works appropriately. And we're really excited about it. And what works for Madison, obviously. So, um, and then again, the goals. We we decided to take take it down to Madison as a community that um, exhibits high vitality and connects people. So these are based on our themes too. Works at sustaining a high quality of life for all and is resilient in the face of current and future challenges. Um, and is growing responsibly and offers all residents the opportunity to participate in that growth. So so pretty broad, but I think. Um, they work well within the context of the plan of conservation and development. So um, going back to our themes and perspectives, we we had these paired themes that we we worked out. I guess I think before our last before the last time I came to you. So by March we already had these of vitality and connectivity, resilience and sustainability, opportunity and growth, and we we applied those to the two perspectives, which are the natural environment and the built environment. Thanks, Jean. So this is what we, where we started heading with those two environments, um, a list of policies, and that's when we started to see all the overlap. Um, so then we, next slide, we mapped out what, where the similarities and differences were and what we thought we needed to do going forward, what direction we should take. 
And we decided we didn't want to maintain these two separate environments. We wanted to combine them. Next slide. So this is what it starts to look like. And this is where it's great to have these different matrix capabilities. We use Trello and I think something called House of Quality. <laughs> So again, yeah. with new commissioners on board, we have new talent and new skills. And you know, I come from the nonprofit world, so this is all sort of new to me. It's great. Um, and this is where we this is where we we're heading then. And um, we'll run through these policies. I think did you all get hard copies or at least you were sent yeah, copies? Today. Today, yeah. So. so you can have take yeah. your time looking through them, and we will be obviously reaching out to you in a formal way when we have to go through the whole process, the 65 day process of, you know, getting the stakeholders buy in, getting your buy in and getting approval. But just so you know where we're headed, this is what it starts to look like. Next slide. And these are our policies. Um, should I go ahead and read that or can anybody, can anybody what the board wants to accomplish tonight? I think the goal, you know, obviously we're going to be coming back with some specific thoughts. Absolutely. I think, you know, yeah. this is more so these are the seven oh, policies we've yeah. come up with that combine, and you can see that yeah. some are more specifically for the built environment, some are more specifically for the natural environment, but there is overlap. I'm also happy to share this kind of information <laughs> presentation with anybody else who's interested. Um, and then I went, we went, took it to the next step, which was to talk about the actions that we've um, identified. And this is based also mostly on feedback we had from all the different stakeholders. So the next slide. Oh, sorry, we, this is what we did. Actually, Bob Reinhardt did this, so you could read it. Um, a little larger font, but going through the different policies. So there's yeah. three out of seven. Yeah. And then the next slide is the remaining four out of seven. Oh, funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. We realized, well, actually, we had, to, we had to pitch this to our own commission first to make sure that everyone was comfortable putting all these different action items and a different together in a different way. And um, that's why we, we did it this way. So here it is where, you, again, you can, you know, I just want you to see what the policies are looking like and the action items underneath them. Some have more, some have subcategories within the action items. We realized that we had um, very kind of inconsistent plans and implementation action items. So we kind of broke them down appropriately. We thought so that some are very quick and easy, kind of low hanging fruit. Others are big picture. And we didn't want to lose any of those, even though they were inconsistent. So we've combined them in these kind of outline forms that I think will work well. Well, these, well, seeing similarities with some of the implementation plan pieces yep. that we have from the strategic Oh, interesting. Yeah, because yeah. I don't think I've seen your implementation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's kind of still a work in progress. Yeah. I mean, there's kind of like headliners and stuff, but we'll yeah. be digging to this level in certain areas. So, yeah. So it's like the bike pet study, obviously. The uh, yep. Um, these are things that have been in motion. Some of some be, of these are yeah. very much underway, yeah. and yeah. so it'll be nice to have them all listed and align with the you know with the POCD as well. So. The other thing I think we did at our last meeting was I tried to draft with no numbers or letters because I didn't want to try to I didn't want to I didn't want to imply that there was prioritization. Yeah. I got shot down. Um, <laughs> we need numbers. We need letters. You know, you need to be able to refer to policy one C and um, and not have to explain it all the time. So I want to say again then that these are not prioritized necessarily. That you know we sort of see them as having equal weight and balance. So, um, these, so these aren't things necessarily that the commission would be doing. They're no, no, that's when the, the, the implementation gets yeah. into the details yeah. of who's responsible right. for what. Right. And um, so we'll, we'll work with you all on yeah. you know, comparing how right. your implementation for the strategic plan works and how ours does. Yeah. And also depending on town staff, because we're relying heavily, I think, on town staff. Mm -hmm. Don't want to overwhelm them, but we want we want to be able to accomplish these actions in the next 10 years or so. And actually, let me take a deep breath and just say also, this is a living document. And we do hope that it will be updated and changed and, and modified as needed. I mean, you know, one of the things we've been talking about is the storms, recent storms and, you know, models are so outdated. And so how do we try to project, you know, what's, what the world is going to look like in 10 years? So. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we could just flip through, I think there's seven slides for the different policies. Yeah. So you can see that, you know, some have a lot of information and a lot of action items. Some were um, 
I think four or five only. Here's the, oh, the I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Jim, could you just back up once? Um, the housing uh, section, again, we're working with the affordable housing group closely and wanna make sure that we're supporting and reinforcing their plan and then expanding it a little bit more broadly. Okay, thanks, Jane. So next steps. Um, so we have to complete dra drafting all the action items uh, for each policy, incorporate the action items into implementation chart, uh, incorporate mapping. We don't have our maps yet in our, in our rough draft uh, or our working draft of the plan of conservation and development. Also, one thing we're gonna have to do is update it to 2024, not 2023, because we are here in 2024. Um, hold public meetings, for discussion of the draft, finalize policies and actions, mandatory referrals and postings of draft according to state statutes, and then hold public hearing and adopt the plan. So coming down the home stretch, and that's it. That's, that's my presentation. Um, again, I wanna thank Bob Reinhart for putting most of that together and Aaron Maddox and I worked on it for a little further. Carol, is that available on the planning and zonings page on the town website so that folks um this PowerPoint? Yeah. Not yet, but we'd be happy to share it. I yeah. think folks in town would probably like the opportunity to take a look just so that they have a better understanding of all of the pieces that you guys have been working Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a lot of work. And in fact, I think I, I last time I looked at our website, the draft of the POCD that was up there was back from July and it was really crude and <laughs> barely there and so we need to get we have a november december draft that we're feeling pretty comfortable with we need to get that on as yeah. like as well yeah if both that draft and this powerpoint could get loaded up on there yep that would be helpful for the public yeah so, thanks so yeah. you have a um similar to we did with the strategic plan an opportunity that's more of an in, not a formal public hearing but a information sessions so people could come and like give yeah, I think that's a comments. great idea Peggy you know we've yeah. sort of been feeling that because our meetings are public meetings and and we've we've been invested in it so that the first meeting of every month for planning and zoning has been the planning and the POCD primarily um so we've had we've had people coming to that but I think yeah I think when we get it into sh into a, a pretty final state it would be great to have a more public um forum yeah to get feedback. Okay. Obviously, we don't want to completely restructure it at that point, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Carol, keep it for context. So this is every 10 years. You do this? That's correct. It's required every 10 years. Every 10 years. So, there's a little leniency, obviously. Of course. You know, if you go a few months late, it's okay. So, so I'm curious, just even what you just presented and maybe the draft that's up on the, will be up on the town website. Yeah. Um, how much is new? How much is, Reuse. I mean, is it you know? Do so, we leverage fifty percent of it? We start from a draft. Do we? Yeah, you know, we did. Sheet? Is it? We did review the previous two thousand thirteen to two thousand twenty to twenty twenty three yeah. POCD. Um, I think I spoke that about that in March because there were so many implementation actions that never got done. You know, so we went through those and kind of filtered to see what did we want to continue and carry on. Um, but we're really approaching it with a fresh start in many ways. And, um, you know, based also on what the state plan looks like and what the regional, the SCROG Regional Plan of Conservation and Development, which is actually where we took the natural environment and built environment, they also had the human environment, which was kind of an interesting concept, but we felt that human environment kind of applies to everything. So we didn't need to say that separately. And even now, as I've said, we've combined them into two. And, and actually, in the process of doing this, I think Bruce at the last meeting you asked, or last time I gave a presentation, you said, "What well, you know, what kind of surprised you?" One one thing that's really surprised me about Madison is that it's almost 50-50 built in natural environment. It's like 46-44. And you know, and so I felt like that just knowing that sort of physical evidence about the town um, helped guide how we approached and moved forward. And how we're responding to the needs of the town. You talked about how you expected this to be a living document. Yeah. Um, and is that living after it's adopted? Yep. So, so it is subject to change. And so as the strategic plan grows and changes, this document can grow 
and change. Absolutely. And vice versa, because there, there's really a very circular conversation, right? One informs the other. They both inform each other. And we want, yeah, we want them to be collaborative in a way. Yeah. Um, I will say that I don't think the 2013 to 2023 plan of conservation and development was ever changed. Um, so, you know, we say we want it to be a living document, then it's up to us to make it a living document. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think I make that comment because over the years, we would hear somebody be surprised that mm -hmm. the town was going in a direction and the response was, it's in the POCD. Right, right. right. And it, it, it was almost like it's in stone. We said we were going to do it no problem. and that's it. And so the <laughs> argument, the argument was back in 2013. The other thing though, Bruce, was that to me, the previous one, you could almost find whatever you wanted to in it, you know, and, and that's, you know, maybe a successful POCD because it covers everything, but I found it difficult to work with because yeah, just what. But I think that honest um, challenge to an initiative of why are we doing this shouldn't be met with uh, it's in the POCD. Right. It, exactly. It, it should be there should be a thoughtful response back, not just a can. And it relates to our values and yeah. you know who we are There's as a town. And, and, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Depending on the times. I mean, I, I, ten years is a long time. It's let's, a long let's be, time. Right. Transparent about that. It's a long time. I think you know things in our town are going to change and evolve and in ways that we. I'm can't actually kind of surprised that nothing had changed in ten years. So. Well, I, the, the the other feedback I had heard is that on the last POCD there was no person or or I shouldn't say person they they the previous ones that had a committee yes to ensure that you were it was being followed that it was being updated and this last one for some reason they never did that they just dropped it yeah yeah it, and so um, well and also Peggy I think that you know Dave Anderson had just come on board as the town planner when the last one was mm -hmm. approved and. So I think a lot of it sort of fell on him to coordinate all that. Right. Now, you know, now we've learned that, yeah, is that yeah. a good idea? I mean, he is, and well, have you thought about that, like, piece of, uh, like, what we're going to be doing is talking about that internally a little bit more about how to make sure that the strategic plan doesn't just start. Yeah. We have an implementation plan that we've started, but, you know, some of the recommendations from the consultant was you need to have, like champions for things, people yeah. that their job yeah. they're responsible for, and they have to make sure these things get done. And then the board is going to help hold those people mm -hmm. accountable for that. So maybe that's a conversation we have, you know, because it's hard for you as a volunteer board to dictate, right? Or, yeah, I mean, we're also, implement, we're right? also delegate, you know, delegating to other commissions right. and committees right. and identifying right. who, who all would be involved. And one right. thing that we noticed in the previous one is that if you have too many people involved, it never gets done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. that everybody mm -hmm. sort of assumes someone else is going to take care of it, and it ha doesn't happen. And especially when there was no oversight, no sort of ombudsman mm -hmm. making sure that these policies were actually being put into action. And I think the town's affordable housing plan actually has a good example of how different pieces of that plan are cast to different entities mm -hmm. within town. So. Mm -hmm. You know, just helps to keep. It will be something like that. Yeah. more manageable. And we have the same consultant who is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it's kind of a small keep planning world when yeah. you get down well, to it. And maybe that's part of when we have a more collaborative, you know, uh, discussion with you about our thoughts. We talk about that and and come up with something that makes sense as a town, whether it's staff, a volunteer committee, or something where we have that a good plan in place, right? Right. To make sure it doesn't. Right. And I think it also help identify if additional staff are needed, you know, if we need right. to restructure commissions and committees and right. Yeah. Be interesting. I found some real gems in here. Um, uh, uh, the core document is wonderful. I found some real gems in here that impressed me. One was um, calling for um, helping the students in our schools understand and appreciate some of the natural uh, environments and systems that are going on. I think a second one was a call for helping to educate private landowners about stewardship and appropriate activities to take place or should not take place on private land. And the third one was a call to work more closely with the Madison Land Trust. 
Yeah, and we've had, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of discussion about all of these. We've, we've asked ourselves, you know, it's not our position to tell the Board of Education or the schools how to teach kids, but outside of that environment, how can we support and back up and... I mean, you, you just mentioned the Leonardo show at the library. Yeah. That's an amazing yeah. thing. <laughs> you know, and if we can have more awareness also, just education and awareness, reaching out to the community and get more community involvement, I think, too. So, yeah, yeah thank you. Great. Oh, yeah. um, so the other thing, maybe do you want to just spend a minute about the, um, the meeting that you're planning? Uh, in February with the, uh, the housing, housing meeting. Yeah, yeah. Yes. so so we're going to be getting together and giving a, a public presentation. Thank you, Peggy, for helping us organize it. Um, I think just to talk about to focus on the issues with housing in the in in the town because they are big issues and you know the feedback from the strategic planning workshops and everything. So much of it was about housing for everybody, including seniors and young families, and you know not just not just being afraid of the uppercase A, uppercase H, affordable housing, which I like to describe it that way, but just looking at, you know, what is what is needed in the town and who, you know, the way we're phrasing it is that we just want to do whatever we can so everyone can live here who wants to live here. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we talked, we got together with the affordable housing committee chair and um, there's going to be kind of a, uh, a facilitated meeting um, and and uh, Jen participated in that discussion as well. And I think it's going to be a, a great opportunity to start that conversation in the community about what are our housing needs. Mm -hmm. uh, because so much of it is kind of focused on a specific development or a specific or this affordable issue or a 3 g or whatever, you know. So let's talk more broadly and let people come forward and talk about the different housing needs because it's and all over the spectrum. And, and we talk about as you said, housing for all, trying to figure out how do we accommodate all the different needs. And new ideas, yeah. and, you know, look at what other communities are doing yeah. to address the and housing does, shortages. Yeah. The, it, the affordable housing, how does that intersect too with preserving our open spaces, preserving sure. our historic structures? Because there is a lot of conversation that's gone on about that um, through the consultants <coughs> that are working with Scrog. Right. So I think that's definitely an important piece of the puzzle to incorporate for, you know, the general public is that it's not an all or nothing. There is a way to marry the two together um, for positive outcomes. And you're, and you're right, there will be a facilitator from Scrog. Yeah. It's a, actually, I think it's a father-son duo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Right. Who will be housing. who will be helping us and guiding us? Yeah, yeah. And so, bringing, bringing... so it'll be a nice. So we're gonna. I think we're firming up the date, and that'll be, it'll be in February, and we'll get um, promote that to the public, and it can be in person. We'll also have people be able to attend online. Um, but I'm, but I'm it's curious. like a first step to really yeah. Have, yeah. To have that conversation start. But I'm curious, even in that conversation, how, you know, leading up to it, how much do we lean on the experience? of other shoreline towns or other towns that are the same as ours. I mean, at the end of the day, this is not a unique problem just to Madison. No, it's it's across the country. Yeah, it's course, global right. even, yeah, I right. would say. Um, yeah, I think that's, you know, we do work with other communities. I'm the rep for our planning, for the planning group for this, for Scrog. Um, and I find actually that Madison's kind of an outlier in that, in that, in that section of Connecticut, you know, where there are a lot of more urban areas and more rural areas, and then we're the shoreline town, the shoreline town farthest east. So we're also working, I think, with Old Saybrook, and you know, all the shoreline communities have more in common in a way than the and south maybe. central Connecticut region that has been defined by the state, I guess. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And our affordable housing committee members have been very active in reaching out to other towns, other parts of the country, yeah. even, to yeah. find out, having talks with developers and town leaders and that sort of thing to see what other folks are doing and are there opportunities that would fit for Madison as opposed to what fits for everybody else, but what are people doing that would fit here? And even, I mean, I'm reading articles about what's happening in New York City because, you know, there was recently a, an opinion piece published about using historic properties and taking, you know, basically level it, leveling them so you could build more housing. And, you know, there's a big rea reaction in today's paper and the letter letters 
including Sarah Bronin, who's been so instrumental in oh, Desegregate in Connecticut, today? saying, yeah, saying, you know, you don't have, it's not an either or, you can, yeah. you know, you have other buildings to look to or other yeah. places to look to to build versus tearing down historic properties to accommodate housing needs. And, you know, on a small scale, we're there. Um, and mixed use properties to adaptive got, reuse. Yeah, yeah just know, looking at things differently. Ground floor residential above. Yeah. Well, and I think what one of the things as part of this is an educational component because a lot of people don't understand that some of our zoning restricts things like that. Right? right. So it's trying to educate, like, well, our zoning actually won't allow us to do that. That's why we might need our to zoning is very restrictive. Yeah. So we need to like look at those reforms possibly if we want to encourage this type of housing or changes to happen. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so at the risk of saying we're drifting off yeah. of the <laughs> <Yeah. right? laughs> I know we well got some other guests well here, so. Uh, thank but thank you very much for that, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Yeah, right. Just so I understand the timeline-wise, real quick, when do you think, like, the we're, board would be giving more formal feedback on the POCD? We're hoping within a month or so we'll okay. be in a much better place. Okay. Um, maybe I'm speaking too optimistically, but. Um, in the next two months, like February, March. Yeah, I mean, we okay. want to wrap this up by April, May. If okay. We can. Okay. You know, we're counting down right. days at this point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the clock is ticking. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. I appreciate yeah. it. So, yeah. um, so we'll go move on to our next item. Um, and um, uh, I wanted to give an update on our food scrap uh, recycling program that was started uh, in last May, um, which we have uh, two of our consultants who are advising us on this. So. Kristen Brown and um, Pam Roast have been working hard on that. So they've been basically running the program for us. Um, and so I thought it'd be good to give a, just kind of overview of the program of where we are right now and why we're doing this. Um, and then we want to talk a little bit about where we go from here because, um, and we actually have somebody here from deep too, Ethan Van Ness, who is working on these types of programs. So, um, so this was something that, you know, if you talk about at our, COG meetings, we've had, I can't tell you how many presentations about the waste, waste crisis in uh, the state of Connecticut right now. Mm -hmm. People just don't get it, and you, it, but no one else knows about it. Like, it is becoming a huge problem, and they'll walk through about, um, and yet, you know, we're trying to figure out how are we going to make it better. This is like a tiny sliver of that. It's like a first baby step to try to help address that, um, and so this pilot program through funding through DEEP um, enables us to kind of test some ways to address the waste crisis, mm -hmm. um, but there's going to have to be a lot more follow through. And um, and being a town that we don't have municipal trash service, mm -hmm. we really have no control over what residents do with their waste um, because we don't uh, we don't even really regulate the uh, uh, people that provide uh, collection in our town either. So it's all private hauler. Um, and so you know, this was a voluntary program. It's very complicated to do. And um, and so, and also to, uh, to Al, you, you know, have seen to make sure that they're actually doing what they're supposed to do. <laughs> uh, so, um, so this was kind of a little mini way to like realize all the challenges the town would have to do any kind of regulation or way to address the waste crisis. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Kristen. I guess you're going to do the presentation. Okay. Yeah. And um, I know you're glad you, you don't have your glasses. I don't. I'm borrowing things. I guess so. <laughs> That's good. Um, I can't see anything, but now it's fine. Um, so my name is Kristen Brown, and I'm the consultant for DEP, and I'm working on projects um, for other for 15 other municipalities in Connecticut. I've been in garbage for 35 years, so specifically focused on residential waste reduction strategies in the US and also in Europe. So um, this has been a really fun project because there are 15 cities and towns doing it. Um, I also have Pam and, and Ethan, as you mentioned here with me today. So if you have questions for anyone, um, but I'm gonna just go through, it'll take about 10 minutes just to give you a, a high level overview of, of where we are, what's happening and what we think next steps should be. So next slide. Um, these are some of your other towns that are also in the process of, of um, this pilot process. Uh, you all did start in May, so you're coming up for the end of your pilot will be May. So next slide. Um, so click this just a couple of times and it'll show you a few different things. Um, there is a waste crisis, not just in Connecticut, maybe one more, I think does it. 
Um, one more. Uh, okay. Um, so <laughs> it's not just Connecticut. So again, I've been doing this for 35 years. It's everywhere. Um, we knew this when I was working back in Europe, right out of college. They had a waste crisis. We were having it too. We just ignored it in the United States. They, they did something about it. Um, we had 6,000 6, landfills when I started doing this back in the 1980s, late 80s. Um, today, we have just over 1,000 landfills remaining in the United States. So that's a really big deal. That's a huge number, and it's it's something that no one really realizes. Um, we have a we had about 85 incinerators, and now we're down to about 75 incinerators that also help to, you know, incinerate, burn the trash for energy. Uh, in Connecticut, you had six. Now you're down to four. Um, the big one just closed, Mira in Hartford. Uh, so it's not just Connecticut that's facing this crisis. It really is the entire country. Um, but because New England is um, you know, well, heavily populated with a small land area, you have fewer land mill, landfills remaining. So this chart looks at the gray line is New York and the blue line is Connecticut. So you can see landfill capacity by 2040 is going to be almost nothing in New England and New York even less. So what happens is we ship our waste out of state, um, anything that we can't take care of within the state. Uh, next slide. Uh, the other thing that's kind of happening is the other states don't really want our trash. You can't necessarily blame them. So New Hampshire is the first one. They have two, they've introduced two bills this session. They currently take a lot of the trash from Massachusetts. They're trying to stop that from happening. Pennsylvania and Ohio, West Virginia, South Carolina take Connecticut's trash, primarily Pennsylvania and Ohio. But again, at any point, if a state doesn't want our trash, we can't necessarily, I mean, you know, where is it, where is it going to go? So it really is not just a crisis in the state, but it is a crisis everywhere. And we don't necessarily see that changing. What they do in Europe that they do differently is they don't consider the trash trash. They consider it materials and they manage their materials differently. So these pilots have been designed to help everyone think differently about their trash uh, and, and focus on two key um, programs. So next slide. Um, and the programs are um, unit-based pricing and food scrap collection. And when you look at the waste stream in general, um, you can see that most of what we throw away, in fact, EPA will tell you 75% of what we actually throw in our trash can could be diverted someplace else, whether it's bringing your hangers back to the dry cleaner, whether it's you know recycling your textiles, clothes, even if you only have one shoe, if you always wonder, I always wondered with my kids why there was only one and what they did with the other one, but you can actually bring those shoes to Goodwill. Socks. Socks, they turn the <laughs> shoes, yes, socks, I never have to. Um, the, but they actually turn the, the shoes into basketball courts and under underlayment for um, different types of tiles or, or wood. So there's something that can be done with anything if you have a good steady stream of feedstock and if you have a good system for collecting it. And that's what they have in Europe, and we have less of that in the United States. So that's what we really have to build on is figuring out this new infrastructure. Um, next slide. Uh, when you look at the waste stream, um, something that we talked about, you talked about here with resilience and climate change. Um, food scraps contribute to a little over 20% of the waste stream itself, what we're throwing out, but 58% of the emissions. So if we could take those food scraps out of the waste stream and move them into a stream where you can capture those emissions and turn that into energy, that's a significant change in what our waste contributes to climate change. So, and that's by weight, right? And that, percent of the waste stream right, by, by waste. weight. And then, yeah. So it, it is really important to think differently about our food scraps. And that's the, one of the primary aspects of the pilot that you've been doing. Next slide. Uh, so you, I consider Madison and Guilford together because you started at the same time, your neighbors, and you kind of intermingle. And you also share the transfer station. You should be part of Guilford. Oh, okay. So you've got a lot in common. You understand um, hate Guilford. <laughs> um, but, but when you look at how you dispose of your trash, as Peggy mentioned, you, you have the transfer station, but you also have many of the homes just hire a hauler. But there's still an expense to that. So you're, you're spending about $6.9 million throwing away trash. Um, and together, so between the two of you, about 6.9. But if you added in a separate food route collection for food scraps, which there are companies that can pick up your food scraps, you know, you're getting up to you know, over $11, 000, $11 million a year spending on trash. So even though you're not 
you know, handling that for residents, your residents are still paying for it. So how can we think differently about this whole system to hopefully either save money or at least mitigate risk or mitigate long-term costs? Um, how can we create a system that works better? So next slide. Uh, next. So what you're trying out here is something called UBP, um, unit-based pricing. And it is a way of thinking about your trash differently. So in the pilot homes, um, they they didn't they're not actually paying for their special trash bags or their food scrap bags, um, but they they were given a certain number and they were asked to try to you know work within their allotment. So to think differently about everything that they throw away, they were given two orange thirteen gallon trash bags a week and one green eight gallon food scrap bag. And the idea was no matter how big your family was, try to fit into those two bags of waste and one bag for food scraps. And most people from all the audits we've done have done a great job with that. So it's something that's entirely possible to do. Um, I had a babysitter with my kid when my kids were little and I wondered why she was so great at organizing the trash because I would come back and you know there was no waste and I was kind of a nut about trash because I've been in this industry. And she goes, oh, my family has something called unit-based pricing. We, live in, we lived in Vermont and we had 12 in our family and my mom would only let me use one bag a week. And I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? And this, this is the key to behavior change because just like electricity or water or anything that else that you pay for, if you're sort of allotting yourself a certain amount or paying by the unit, you're thinking differently about everything that you throw away and you're realizing all that can come out of the system. So in 1990, when I started this, um, the average per capita in the United States was about 900 pounds of disposal a year. Um, right now we're in the 720 pounds per capita range. Um, next slide. Um, and we've had all of those things that you saw listed over there, but we've added the bottle bill. We have, we have curbside recycling. We have so many opportunities to recycle. Um, but we're still at only 740 pounds. Well, the one community here in Connecticut that has unit-based pricing, Stonington, they throw away only 386 pounds per capita. So thinking differently about you, the way you pay for your trash is, is what you know, creates this change. Uh, we see this in the Northeast. There are about 550 communities that have unit-based pricing. So it could be a hauler. It could be the town itself. And the way that it works is you pay a fee, like in a hauler situation, you would pay a cost for the hauling service. That means you hire a hauler, he comes by your house, but you pay for the amount that you actually put out. So if your neighbor is filling up their cart, they're paying more than you're paying if you're not filling up your cart. And that really, what that does is it makes everybody throw away less and think differently about their trash. So next one. When you add the ability to collect curbside food scraps, you get down to about 225 pounds per capita. So when you think about our waste crisis and the fact that we ship so much waste out of state, this really does change the dynamic. If we can change the way that we think about our trash, I guess the best way to think about it is you come home from the grocery store with all of your groceries and you have cans of soup and you have boxes of cereal and you have different items. When you put it away in your cupboard, you just don't empty the bag and throw it all in one place. You put the cans with the cans, the cereal with the cereal, you put, you organize it. So it's just really, when you unpackage it, you just organize it when you throw it away. And if food goes in one place, the recycling goes in another. And believe it or not, a lot of people don't. A lot of people just throw it all in the trash. Um, next track, next slide. Um, this is very prevalent. Again, 550 communities throughout um, New England, also a lot of communities in New York. When you see this, you see a 50, at least a 50% waste reduction every time a community implements a program that has these parameters. Next slide. Uh, hit this a couple of times, I think. Um, these are just a few um, uh, towns that I've actually worked with in the past. Um, and, and I think what's great about it is if you create a program that has this type of um, pricing system, um, you get a change the day, the week you start it. You can see it comes down immediately. Um, it also stays down. So once you start the program, it doesn't, you know, it, waste does not change. Once people think about it and they're paying per unit, the, the waste does not go up. Um, this one is a fun one. Um, the, this is Sanford, Maine. They actually implemented a unit-based pricing program. Trash went down. A few months later, um, someone won the lottery that lived in Sanford, Maine and, <laughs> and didn't like the concept. So they put up billboard signs mm -hmm. and council decided to take it out. Again, this was a town program, so it was different than yours. But you can see trash went back up. Uh, and then 
he moved away apparently and they decided to bring it back. Um, so they talk about it all the time. They'll, they'll do presentations for you. So, um, so it, it, it is a, it's an interesting, you know, trash is very personal to people. It's very difficult to change, you know, trash, but trash is a big, um, you know, co contributor to climate change. So it is really important for resiliency and the future. Um, next slide. Oh, one more. Okay. So, um, sort of next steps here. Uh, what you have in your current system is you've got the subscription haulers. Um, we've kind of done a survey of pricing. It's somewhere between $440 to $480 a year. If you added on a food scrap collection to get that food scrap out, you'd be adding a separate route, and you also have, you know, would have to pay more money, uh, an additional $360,000. So, um, so the system currently, um, there are some cons to your system, not just the cost, but you have a lot of vehicles on the road. So if some of you live on dead ends, you might have two different haulers and then the, the recycling truck comes and now you would have a blue earth truck come. So you've got a lot of movement on the streets, so road traffic. Uh, and, and you don't really, as these costs go up, your haulers are just gonna raise their price because you don't have a lot of say when you're a resident just contracting with the hauler. And I don't know if you noticed, but on your waste bill, especially from haulers, you'll get those surcharges, surcharges yeah. for fuel, surcharges for COVID, surcharges for this and that. So um, so you don't have a lot of control of the cost. Um, you don't, you know, um, one of the, the West Hartford is one of the other towns that's looking at moving this forward cities. And their thing is, well, it just goes away except away is somebody else's house, somebody else's home. And here the, the hauler comes, they pick up your trash and then it goes away, but it goes you know, to somebody else's neighborhood far away. Uh, and so you know, thinking differently about social accountability and, and also keeping these materials inside of the state. So the more food scraps that we can um, capture inside of the state, um, the more likely we are to fe give feedstock to programs that could um, provide local compost for your garden club that was just here earlier, or for um, an anaerobic digester that can create biogas within the state instead of shipping it elsewhere. You're, you're creating that sort of circular economy. Um, and also the other con is just from what we've learned, one of the learnings from the pilot, and you may have known that before, sometimes the haulers are a little bit difficult to work with. Um, the pros to your current system are your customers can choose who your residents can choose whatever they want, whoever they want. Um, and it also doesn't take any time from your town administration. So there are pros to what you currently do, um, but also some cons. So, so some of some next step, next, next slide. So some of our next steps are, is we're looking at how do we design a system that, that could be an optional system for residents. It could be a better choice for residents. It could be we could design something within the current hauler system that you have. Um, but the one of the key aspects is the idea of co-collecting it. So the extra collection route is quite expensive. Um, an extra collection route for food scraps for restaurants or larger institutions makes a lot of sense. But stopping at each individual home, especially if they're spread out, it's very expensive. Um, so what we did in your pilot, and this, this is actually your trash, um, in the pictures, um, yeah, there seems to be a pineapple there or something, I'm not sure, but um, they, the residents put trash in the orange, didn't always do it perfect, um, food in the green, uh, and then it was smushed together in the truck, <laughs> brought to Wallingford, it goes out on the floor, and then it comes across a, a conveyor belt where people pull the green bags out so the, the food waste can be digested, uh, and then the orange bags go on for disposal. So this is actually your trash, but that's what you're looking at there and and next slide. And what we know, these are a couple of the data points. I can tell you that you have a, a food and audit going on to on Thursday um, where we'll be weighing and auditing your trash again. But you seem to be capturing a lot of the available food scraps. So could be you know, up to 70 percent of that available food scraps from those homes. So that's a really good sign. And to put that into perspective, um, you know, as as we've been trying to recycle for the past 30 or 40 years, we're capturing about 8% of our plastic, about 14% of our textiles, 25% of glass. So you're already capturing 73% of your food the last time that we looked at that. So I, so we feel really good about, you know, as a, as a, as a program, we think it can work. It's just a matter of figuring out how, how do we make this cost effective for residents and how do we make it something that can work for um, within the parameters of what is happening in Madison and Guilford. So next slide, I think. 
I think I'm just gonna, yeah. So really the next steps that we have are, um, we wanna finish this pilot going through till May. Um, there is some potential bridge funding available from DEP if you wanna take some additional steps. So we'd like to take the time between now and May to work with, you have a current transfer station advisory committee. So sort of our, our ask, our request is to task them with looking at how can we review a system to see if there's any next steps you wanna take, any bridge funding that you might want to apply for um, while you still have the time to do that. Um, so our really, I guess our big ask here is, is we'd love to work with your committee um, and review some different pathways forward. Um, for both towns, Madison, Guilford, we have had a webinar with um, a couple of towns, um, South Hold, New York, Middletown, Rhode Island, that both have private subscription hall and, and do a program like what we're talking about and have seen that 50% waste reduction. So we wanna see if it's something that could fit for the town here. That, that's, that's it. Great questions. Um, I wanted to ask you, how do you measure success with this pilot? How do you know if, if the pilot is successful? Well, it's difficult because you, we just picked X number of homes to do it. So for the, the main thing I think is the food scrap capture rate and the cleanliness of the food scraps. So with the 15 communities that we've worked with, we it's ranged from some of our contamination has been in the 30% range where yours is about is less than 1%, which means that people understand what they're supposed to put in the bag. Um, the, some of what we find in the 30% range is people understand they should put food in there, but they don't understand that they should take the coleslaw out of the package. They just throw the whole thing in, the jelly jar, you know, so it's there. It's a learning process, but with the way that we rolled this out, we have great participation from the homes that are doing it, and they're doing a good job with what they are putting in the bag. How do you evaluate hauler compliance with this pilot? So that part is difficult. Right now, we just have one hauler doing it, so that part's easy. Um, part of the task, you know, if we move something forward, is is designing a system that that where we can audit what's happening to make sure that they're following the rules. Or or maybe it's that you create one, it's one hauler system for both towns or one town. Um, there's all different pathways forward. It's kind of a, ma a matter of what you're most comfortable with. Are you seeing pressure starting to be put on some of these private haulers, you know, in terms of changing their systems? Yes. Yes, I would and I say. I gotta think there's sort of a foreshadow here mm -hmm. might be to come. Yeah, 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 definitely. We've seen a lot of change. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I think I think the big challenge is is what is the revenue for a regulatory? Right. We don't have any real uh, regulatory ability to require them to do this, and and this is for them. It's a challenge, right? Because um, they had to do a separate route to do this co collection program for us, and then the um, and then the food scraps go to a totally different location, right, than where normally they take the trash. So that's also another added element to their routes. Mm -hmm. um, there's expense associated with it. Um, so, you know, that's all going to have to be figured out. But I think, if, you know, there's a view. I, I will just say we've been doing the program. Mm -hmm. um, and you've been doing it as well. Oh, yeah. I love it. Yeah. And, and I'm amazed <laughs> yeah. how heavy that bag is. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Of scraps, it's it's, it's unbelievable. Food scraps, right? Like, yeah, I love jam. And, and we have the whole combo. Yeah. It's like satisfying. Well, <laughs> yeah. you, you actually put in your refrigerator. And when you yeah. you go through and you're like, oh, I gotta get rid of this stuff because it's and your kitchen can doesn't get yeah. smelly because yeah. you know you're do, like you don't have any of that meat waste or anything in there. And, and we always had like a, a compost for just you know greens mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and um, that we would kind of use on and off. But this could take everything. You know, mm -hmm. all food scraps. So we have a dog too. So I was very, we have a dog, you know, we have kids. Yeah. Um, but we've managed to work within most weeks the two orange trash bags with, you know, family of four with kids and a dog. And uh, and then that food scrap bag is had, had like, we had ribs last night, right? So yeah. this is like a heavy, but you realize that's pulling it all out of the system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so those tipping fees, which is what you end up paying in your trash bill. You're paying for the weight of the trash that to get disposed of, right? So, the you know that that raises the cost for everybody, right. um, having all that weight into the into your trash. So, um, so I think it's important we continue the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then I did get to an opportunity to visit the plant, 
Oh, right. In Southington, where I got to do, I went there right in December, and I got to see how they, it was totally disgusting, but <laughs> how the bag gets emptied into this slurry thing, and it ends up getting converted into energy, and, and there's uh, multiple buildings in Southington that are powered by the energy that's created, and, and these, these little mini Plants aren't that expensive to build either. Like, but the problem is you have to drive all, all the way up to Southington to get it there. So, right. you know, I know there's a lot of discussion. The state should start maybe helping develop these in a geographically better location. Yeah. So it takes the cost out of the uh, recycling then, program. Yeah, and then we see the trash disposal fees go up in our school budget and our town yeah. budget and everything. Yeah. Which is a question then that I have: Do they um, have programs like this? for schools and hospitals and, you know, other yeah. institutions? Yeah, I think the hard part right now is it is a bit of a chicken and an egg. And like Peggy just referred to it, you know, there's one plant in Southington, we need more infrastructure, but you got to start someplace. So if everyone keeps waiting till someone else does it, you know, then we're going to be waiting forever. So I think, I think right now we have 15 towns that have tried something. So we want to move them to whatever those next steps can be to help create the feedstock that creates a demand that, you know, wants to put a, a, a location that's closer, which then lowers the cost for everybody. So if that makes sense. We're just in that, we're in that beginning stage of everything, but I do encourage you to, to try to take next steps. I'm not sure what those are going to be, but we'll work with the, the committee and see what they think. And I, I think you don't want to give up. I think you want to keep the conversation moving. You know, so at the end of the pilot, what kind of policy recommendation or direction will we be receiving from you? So I think that's why we want to work with this group. It could be that you, I mean, there are a few options on the table. You could take control of the whole thing and do something townwide or together as two towns. You could say you could create a program with parameters that the haulers follow, and they do that in South Hold, New York. They have independent haulers. They have to they have to use a special bag for disposal. They have to charge, they can charge their own price for the collection. So there's a little variability and people can pick the hauler they want, but they're paying as they go for what they throw away, which then drops the trash in half. Um, and then there's then then there's an idea of, of just a preferred vendor, which is like the Middletown Rhode Island model. And they ended up with 75% of the people saying they wanted to do it. So it might be that if you just have one preferred system, it is the you know granted preferred system, you audit it on a monthly basis or something, just to make sure everyone's following the rules. But then that's a preferred option that a lot of residents might not opt into. So I'm, those are kind of the three off the top of my head, but I really want to get input back from the group. I look forward to uh, debating those. Yes, well, maybe you a, want to join and help. <laughs> how does a small municipality monitor hauler behavior, whether you, you mentioned it could be private hauler or, or municipally hired hauler, but how does a small town government monitor that um, the haulers are doing what they're supposed to be doing under a system? So I think with technology, there's different ways to monitor it. Um, and, and if it's a, it's a town-wide program, you know, that is one thing. If it is each hauler doing their own thing, I think that's where you are now. And that's what makes it more difficult to haul, you know, you got to almost feel like you have to follow them all the time. Um, but yeah. That's, not, that's, that's the first one. one. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know. I have, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing trash day and, you know, our household is only two people, so we don't generate a lot, but there are these 70 gallon trash cans that the lids won't close on some of my neighbors every week. And the 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 idea if they're just watching this casually i have to take that trash can that won't close into 26 gallons now mm -hmm. um but you're not necessarily saying consume less you're saying segregate you differently more. and i yeah. think i think that is as an important part of this conversation because that's where i think a lot of people just listening for the first time are going to go you're telling me I have to consume less and it's more, it's about more effectively pulling out the recyclables right. and thinking and, and, differently and, and about reducing that up. trash. The food waste is, is a whole separate thing, but it's, it's about utilizing really three 
waste streams very effectively. Food, true trash, and recyclables. Right, right. Recyclables and even reusables. So a lot when we do a waste audit, which we audit those cans, those overflowing cans, all that, that's all that we do for this pilot. I mean, this this, this two-year period, we have people auditing on a regular basis. How's Peggy doing? And <laughs> <laughs> we don't specifically target homes, so I'm not sure. But, um, but, but when we, we sort of do go to the ones that are overflowing because we want to understand what's in here, but you do find a lot of bizarre things. Like you can tell someone washed and folded the clothes, put them in, probably thought about going to the Goodwill, never got around to it, and tossed it in the can. Like there is a lot of that. There are, you know, there are working appliances, lamps, toasters, toaster ovens, things that people maybe didn't match the kitchen, maybe they got a new one, but you could have sent it to college with the neighbor kid because it still works like you. And and what happens in these programs is people think differently about all that because then they're like, oh, hmm, I wonder if I should do something else with this. So it's not just the recycling stream. It's just, it's separate. It's just thinking differently also about what, what you throw away or what you consider to be trash. And then do you, if, just if I might, um, I see, um, you know, this is sort of getting everything segregated as quickly as possible, rather than having it be in a big pile on a conveyor belt somewhere, mm -hmm. right? Because that just makes good sense. But there is another step upstream from the consumer, and that is the retail, the, the packaging at the retail level. Oh, right. And I'm not talking about the Amazon boxes. I'm talking about, um, you know, packaging for you know, groceries, uh, the complicated packaging, all of that stuff. And and this strategy will only take us so far. There has to be something. Yeah, it's definitely a two-pronged thing. So if you look at Europe and the way that they do it, they have unit-based pricing plus, they call it the polluter pays principle, which is both. It's, it's, it's extended producer responsibility to the producers and it's responsibility to the consumers. They just call it polluter pays principle. So it's, if you generate anything, whether you're the consumer or the or the corporation, you you're responsible in some way for what you what you're putting out there. So yes, you do need both. Um, this does stimulate behavior change. So in in all the communities that I've worked with in New England that have moved into a program like this, you have the um, the in the town you'll have people. Those restaurants make sure that to go boxes are recyclable. I mean, they get a demand for it. They don't give you something that you can't recycle. They don't give you a phone box. They just, you know, so it, there is an upstream. The, the resident does push upstream and make changes, help to make changes. But yeah, I was going to say actually something very close to that, which is I'm a participant and what goes into the orange bag is shocking how much of it is plastic and, mm -hmm. you know, all the wrapping and, you know, and so when I go to the supermarket now, I do see, you know, is there an option for something that's not wrapped in plastic? And so I think it, you know, it's, it it's insightful. Yeah, yeah, it's insightful to, it, to go through the process. It also makes yeah. you think about your food scraps, you yeah. know, and realizing how much you buy that you didn't use. Like yeah. that is the biggest comment. Well, that my I kids get are happy because I now yeah. throw away the stuff in the back of the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I end up doing it. They don't have to do it for me. Finally. Yeah. No, it's a, it, it is a, um, it, you know, it's a behavior modification, you know, going through that and uh, thinking more about what you're throwing away. Um, I think from the board standpoint, I would assume that we would be supportive of the transfer station advisory, which is we call the solid waste disposal committee, which we're going to be changing that yes. um, and putting a new name and, and actually rethinking the ordinance for that committee. Um, but I think that the, uh, you know, them exploring some recommendations, they look at different options, they come back to Guilford and to Madison with some suggestions. Everybody's supportive of them doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I would add the the hazardous waste component um, because that's we're not yeah. talking about that here. But um, you know, we, we talked about it recently yeah. that that making it easy to responsibly get rid of hazardous waste is is really important. And we used to do it at the transfer station. And, uh, and they don't do it anymore. Um, I just and, my paint to kill it Which they yeah. now have blacklisted you because you said that twice on camera. Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, water-based you paint, you can, you can, you can uh, but I think water-based paint, you can actually just uh, pour it down or whatever, right? Water-based paint, you can still. Yeah. 
there's still paying donations. Yeah. There's schools, there's places you can donate. I yeah. think Home Depot usually will take it back. Yeah. So, but there's waste oil, there's you yeah. know, other things yeah. that have to be because I'm sure that there, there are people that will take the used engine oil, mm -hmm. put it back into the containers, and throw it in the trash. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And that's the type of behavior that if there is an outlet for it, people are thinking when, when you do this, they are starting to think differently. And oh, okay, I'll drop it off here if I can. So, yeah, as long as it's easy. It has a central in New Haven has the program. We, the residents can go there Saturday morning and afternoon from midday to mid October. So we'll they do, but you have to make an appointment. Yeah, and you have to. We're 25 yeah. minutes away. You have to make an appointment. You did the last time I checked. No, you can, I mean, you, can, you, can, you can register online if you want. Or you can, when you go there, you can just give your give a driver's license. But I think Bruce's point is the ease of access. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it's a half hour drive. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. you can have a, a satellite. Like, yeah. Yeah. And we just we've just refunded yeah. that, yeah. Um, but it's expensive. But it is, yeah. once upon a time, yeah. we had that at our local transfer station. That, that was there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. it, and it's an unpredictable because the cost is gone, you know, and, 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 every, and it's highly used. So we yeah. always end up never budgeting enough money to cover it because we don't know what the use is. It's just a tough thing to manage. Yeah, there's so. a balance there. So you want to yeah. dispose of it properly, but there's a cost to it too. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think you're allowed to consolidate it in transportation. I don't think the law allows you to do that. Any more that that yeah. must have been before the oh it could yeah. be I just remember so, twenty years ago you could go and pour your engine oil into a big tank there right. Yeah. Well, it takes paper. We have to dry it out first and then put it out. Yeah. But you can just bring it to if someone wants to close the yeah. they take yeah. like five or ten cans at a time. So it's mm -hmm. a uh, so I think then it sounds like we're good moving forward with yeah, it. Yeah, and yeah. Hear what the recommendations I, are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have two quick questions. Yeah. Um, do I understand that the ultimate solution is probably regional? We're a small town. And to run any kind of uh, far more complicated system like this, it just seems to be beyond the capabilities of small towns. It is, is a regional solution more likely to be a successful solution? I think... Part of this will 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 come forward with a few different ideas. So one of them could be regional. Um, it depending on how you do it, it could be easier. Or it could be more difficult. I mean, but I see. Or you can some... also do nothing. Like it, it's it's it... right. But I also saw that you noted there are five or six states who actually the states mandated mm -hmm. that you have yeah. to be mm -hmm. pricing, which is very helpful. That's helpful. <laughs> That's helpful. But you know, because you know, whereas we are a small town. With a limited subscriber base, right, and we're dealing with larger companies that cross a lot of different communities, and so mm -hmm. it's hard for us to have that. You know, we'd have to pass an ordinance, you know, and then we'd have to enforce it. Um, so, I would say, Al, yes, it would be much easier. Yeah. If, uh, this yes, was, if you could do yeah. it regionally or, yeah, or statewide, it would be you know, for sure easier. Statewide, but... this is how it has to be, and this is how it has to be done, and then we just, you know, the the, the Haulers have to adjust to that, but uh, well, my final question is a bit is a bit personal for me. Um, I was really enthusiastic about this program and got to participate for maybe the first five or six months, and then I was kicked out. Yeah, well, you were oh, out. Yeah, was that a hauler <laughs> issue? Yes, it was a hauler issue. It was. Yes, yeah. We we went down to just one hauler because the one hauler was not doing what they were told. So. They were actually, <laughs> which, uh, which you, actually which you know, separating. Which you know. You were participating. That's what I thought. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. It's true. Doing yeah, it. yeah, yeah, it's hard. I mean, yeah. I got kicked out. That's true in Madison. I think the haulers weren't su sufficiently brought into the pilot so that they were participating fully and understood what was expected. Uh, well, Schweitzer, the whole, Schweitzer has, con has continued to do it. And I know, but they one of the reasons they kicked households out was because they didn't realize the ramifications of committing to the routes they were asked to do. Like there was too many, too many. Yeah, routes. Schweitzer, they had tried. They were trying to to uh, commit to to serving all. You had to get the seven households that um, asked to be part of it that were their customers, and they were trying, and it was just getting to be unreasonable for the amount of money that they were getting. 
we don't give a little bit of money. And so that was supposed to be full of value. So they narrowed there. Yeah. There was well, and then the other hauler. The biggest, I think the problem we had there is he just, they just didn't always bring it to the right spot. They said yeah. they, they only brought it. it was, I, I think this gets to Al's question. Yeah. And that's, do we need more local leadership to be successful in an area that requires this much change to behavior? Yeah, either that or we need just one, uh, you know, opt-in program for those that want to, just an official program. And that, we that is an it. optional way to do it. Yeah. Or, or or there's the do nothing way, but you know we thought we'd take the results, take it to the group, you know, see if there's one of three or four different options to see what's best. There's no question it's more difficult in a community like this in Southfold, um, uh, basically Southfold, New York. The way that it works is they have seven different haulers. Every hauler hauler follows the rule. Um, when they come into the transfer station, and the, their transfer station takes the trash they can eyeball whether they've done it correctly or whether they have it. You, in your case, you'd have to have a disposal site that's that's managing that for you. And the way that it would work is residents would pay as they go for the units of trash that they're throwing out. The revenue from those units would go to pay that disposal facility or could go directly to that facility. So they would have a vested interest in saying that this hauler's not complying, they can't come, come mm -hmm. here. So, I mean, there there could be a little bit of oversight depending on how it's built. I think that's a solvable problem. I mean, the fact that it exists in other communities mm -hmm. is pretty good evidence that that's, that's solvable um, and that it's still in the private sector right. mm -hmm. is evidence. But the the measurement, is the measurement a function of the bags that you purchase so, or is it the bags going in the can? Um, the, I think it's the bags that you purchase, you, you price the bag based on the size and the average weight. So it's almost like a BTU of electricity. I'm buying a small bag with a value of X because I the average weight that's going to go in there is going to be this. And I'm, I'm paying for what I just threw away, like a prepaid telephone. So you right, but you're not getting bag. actually charged on what's in the trash can that week. No, it's you're, the bags it's the, that you've purchased. Yes, right. And, and then, then you which, as you use them as you go. Right, right. right. And then the, the revenue from those goes to that facility to pay the tipping fees. So it's in their best interest, one, to make sure that the weights are all correct, and also to make sure that anyone bringing in trash is only bringing them in in the, right. in the paid for bag. So, so there are some parameters you could set up to make it, make it work. I mean, I, I lived in a community where you just, you have to buy a tax mm -hmm. and they won't take it at the yeah. landfill right. or the local dump unless you have a bag tag. So those were like a dollar each. So every trash bag was a buck. And I remember my father buying the biggest giant clear trash bags <laughs> you could possibly buy. <laughs> like, so for his dollar bag. But I'm just saying they were clear so they would monitor to make sure that you weren't putting recyclables and stuff like that. Uh, Again, that was another Peggy Lyons, check her. Yeah, and that, no, that, <laughs> that, this is not we're, what we're doing today. But, uh, so, um, no, but there's lots of different things. And I know that they've spent a lot of time looking at all these different options that communities have tried. Um, and maybe there'll be a, an interesting solution that they can recommend to us. Good, good. So thank, thank you for you. that. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, and we'll look forward to hearing the follow-up. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, Thank thanks. You. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, next item on the agenda is an update on the Government Point project. So I know we have, uh, is it Mike Doherty? Is that what he's from? That's it. Okay. Um, and so I wanted to, we kind of tentatively last, so to speak, a um, a uh, pro the project design, and we encountered, I guess they encountered some difficulties with that project design. I remember the board looked at something and we were going to take the public information session, but then they got some additional feedback from the state from deep that, um, <laughs> uh, that was complicating that was complicating the design. And so the uh, SLR wanted to run by an accommodation to that before we go to public uh, information session to make sure that you guys are public hearing to be sure that the board is comfortable with the changes they made, right? Is that capture it, John? Yes. And sure. Austin? Okay. Yeah. So it's a, it's, a, yeah. it's a revised plan, but it's it, it keeps the same kind of intent to discuss. So um, if, uh, Mike, if you want to, sh you have a presentation to show. 
Uh, yes, uh, okay. I can't uh, not let me change my video to go on camera, but um, oh, OK, so you OK, I was prepared to share my screen, but if you're uh, going to use this screen, that is fine as well. OK, so as uh, you were saying, uh, just a little bit of background. So we've been working back and forth with DEP and as was mentioned at some of the previous meetings, one of the things we've been trying to wrestle with was the permitting timeline and trying to keep it as, you know, straightforward and compressed as possible because they can get rather lengthy. So in previous iterations of the direct beach access, the kind of stair and terraced area, which is shown on this graphic to the, to the upper portion of it kind of, you know, just west of your existing staircase. Um, we had it further page, you know, south, which was within the coastal jurisdiction limit. And that was triggering issues for the state in terms of how they were going to permit the project, oversee it, kind of uh, provide comments to us. So we went back and forth on a number of things. And the original initial concept was fully in front of the seawall. And um, so that created the greatest uh, you know, impact within the coastal jurisdiction line. We then moved it a little further up and put it about half and half, half upland. So it towards into the point behind the seawall and the other half uh, on, the, on the seaward side of the wall. Again, it was better. They appreciated the effort, but it was still within the coastal jurisdiction. It was still uh, affecting some of the rocky shoreline. And so they said, if you can move it completely within the upland area, so landward of the seawall, or move it completely out of the coastal jurisdiction line, you're even better off. So if we could do it in the upland, it could be what's called a COP or a certificate of permission permit, which is a much faster um, process than a full permit. And if we can get it even further and get it out of the coastal jurisdiction limits, it's 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 actually outside of their um, jurisdiction. And so we wouldn't have to go through a full permit process with DEEP. Um, we would still have some other permits to go through, but it would streamline the process. So in front of you here is that full uh, movement of the direct stair access and the terrace seating out of the coastal jurisdiction limit and in the upland area of the point. So, so this- the original drawing uh, design, you see that overlook is, the round overlook piece? Yeah. It was almost right next to that, right? Right, the front, terrace. right yeah. in front of it. Well, yeah, it was know, just just north of that area, yep. North, yeah. Just like in that bare so, spot. Yeah, so, you know, past like that little green area, that bare spot, exactly. And now right. we're pushing it further north up towards really where the beach starts and where the seawall ends. Um, yeah, it's at the junction point, kind of the turning point in the wall at yeah. that corner. Yeah. Um, so that we're now out of a, otherwise we would have a very extensive permitting process. So is this kind of where the current set of steps was, the one that had like kind of washed out at one point? This is um, just to the west of those steps. More, you can actually see them on that drawing. You see, like the little light. If you go, oh yeah, the little light line to the yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that's I think, yep. I think that's the existing staircase, isn't it? Correct. Yes. Okay. And so, just to provide yeah. a little bit more visual in terms of what we're going to be looking at here, um, we provided these photorealistic uh, images just to to give you know a little bit more information and, and really kind of show what exactly would be taking place. So you would still have direct stair access to one side of this area, which would allow people to pass back and forth uh, from the point to the beach. And then the seating terraced area would be off to the side of those stairs um, to the to the kind of northeast, which would allow people to gather there and have views onto the beach and 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 almost down both sides. Mostly you're going to be looking to the east, but you can still um, capture glimpses of the of the water itself and the rocky point uh, just outside the seawall. So we, we kind of oriented it 
enough with a little bit of an angle so that we can still take advantage of some of those views to the Rocky Point and also uh, the beach area itself. So we've kind of gave up the initial concept of having direct water kind of like access so that you'd be sitting on these terraces and the water would be in fairly close proximity to you uh, just because of the of the length and and involvement of those permits and so while we don't have that with the water coming directly up to the terraces um, you know you will have a very good beach access we've pushed the handrail so it's up against the wall on the western side of the stairs which will actually help to protect some of that um, so it's not just out in space on its own um, it'll give a little bit more uh, stability there a little bit more, you know, wave action that's coming up to that area um, should help there. Um, we think this location will also be better than the existing staircase that's jutting out uh, seaward of the wall when it has uh, movement of the sand from beneath it and really kind of scours out right around the stairs and, and at times has left it completely um, bare of sand underneath that structure. So I, I understand the stairs 100%. I, given the relocation of the seating, yeah. I'm wondering why have it at all. Yeah. Right. Like, what's the? What's I would the rather point. And if and if there's and if there's money to be saved by taking it out, I'd rather see that decked seating area enhanced. Right. With that money, um, I'm not sure that sitting to look down at the sand is. Well, you're actually not sitting. Though, you're, you're, you're kind <laughs> of looking. It's cement. <laughs> Um, would you have a better view of the seating part of that? Do you have another perspective? Yeah, yep. there we go. So, so I actually think you're still able to sit and watch kids, people out on the rocks, you know. Um, I, I get Bruce's point, though, to, you know, what is the line item amount for this particular portion of the project? And can it be utilized in a different area of the project? for better enhancement. I mean, Scott said it too. It's like, that's, are people really going to be sitting on the cement? Is it going to be too hot? No, we don't find, I mean, so the idea would be to use a colorized concrete. So, or a, you could even just a light gray standard concrete um, doesn't necessarily get, you know, that hot that you couldn't sit on it. Um, you could also do other things such as wood slatting on certain portions of it there's other variations you know we didn't go super far with the design of it just because you know we wanted the reaction of the board and um, if it is something that you know you would want, rather see changed or not involved not included at all um, so we didn't take it you know too far but um, we do precast concrete amphitheaters um, with the kind of customized radii and, and different things such as this that are in a lighter color concrete not quite a white, but a cream or a beige that we've used uh, pretty, pretty regularly. And we don't find that people uh, find it too hot to sit on. Um, and so this is kind of a mini amphitheater, almost small outdoor classroom style seating that I think you would still find people would want to sit and, and utilize it, um, even, even though the water is not directly at the, at the edge of it, as was originally entailed. I mean, I think you'll even the stairs, you know, we gave a bit of a flair to them. Uh, we, we figure and when we typically find people will actually still sit on the stairs themselves when the, when there's ample room um, so people can pass back and forth and, and there still could be someone um, taking a break or just, you know, hang out around the stair area itself. I was skeptical when I when you were showing the other angle, but this angle actually I don't like for some reason. I don't know why. I'm still not a fan. Yeah, I'm still not a fan. I mean, a, 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 maybe a bigger staircase. I just don't see it as a natural gathering place where where it was originally located. I got it. I thought that would be just beautiful. Um, this is, you're going to be sitting, at the, the, the amphitheater is sort of facing the stairs, so you're going to be watching people go up and down the stairs. So it's um, like you're facing the ocean. Yeah, you're facing out you're facing towards out. the uh, beach. Well, I don't know. Those three people sitting on the thing are looking right at the stairs because of the way it's it's in a corner. They're they're it's in a corner. So I, I yeah I my personal yeah. view is I don't think it adds 
to it. I don't think it's a natural gathering yeah. place, but so you just rather see no me. seating at all. Is there a structural reason that you need that seating area? No. Is there a significant cost attached to that seating area? Or what? So the original cost estimate had a line item of $125,000 in total. Um, and we've not tried to uh, re-estimate this. Um, I would say it's, it's going to be most likely in that same range. Um. Yeah, so like I would mother who can't really wander around on the yeah. beach and some place just can sit there and, and the watch their kids. Yeah, that's what I saw. That. That's where really like bad. when my kids were running around all the time, I could never see them when I was up at Garvin Point, but I didn't want to sit in the sand. So this is kind of like a nice spot. You could that that's how I view this. There, but, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and you can kind of look at both areas now. You can look on the beach, you can person. you can actually look at the playground yeah. and you can see the uh Picnic areas, but uh, would school groups use them for teaching? Yeah, 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 yeah it definitely. could be good for, and I know they do take kids down for what that horseshoe crap thing and they do different things. Oh, that. that's over yeah. Um, uh, oh no, they do something at surf club. Uh, high school's got a, a science class. Um, so I, I know, like, Lawson, you had some comments too, yeah, if I may. Yeah. So, definitely, um, we have multiple environmental classes that we. We have at the surf club every year that would be a perfect spot um, for that class to gather instead of making their way back up onto the deck at, at the surf club proper um the stairs itself i think is a better design than the original proposed one um, that always made me a little nervous when it was in the water so a lot of slippery you know yeah. rocks um and we're you know, sort of asking people to walk down steps like that. This alleviates that issue as well. Uh, I think that where the the scallop seat is the you know, VIP firework seating. Um, <laughs> to, to that's like the breast spot. <laughs> Say, Austin. Are you at all concerned about um, somebody sliding off that seat? I'm looking at the young lady pictured right on the edge on the top there. Oh, like there's no railing yeah. on the right hand side of it or barrier? Well, I think if, if you're going to use the stairs, you would stay to the, I guess that's the west side. Um, the more railings you put up, the more blocking of the view you're going to have. So I think that's what Mike is talking about there. Uh, that's why they pressed it so far up against the seawall itself uh, is to eliminate any uh, mm -hmm. blockage of the view. Well, a lot of people just sit on the wall, right? You know, a lot of people just <laughs> plop down on that wall anyway. Yep. Very um, common. Uh, yeah, it's very common. Yeah. I think this actually adds a nice element yeah. where people can come and sit. It's easier for seniors. I was going to ask you. And, there... and I'm betting money Bruce is going to sit there. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> what I think would be uh, my preference would be to see that that observation area, that decked area expanded with any any money that would be saved by this. But that's um, I mean, what, what we could do and th this we can have all this itemized in the budget. Right. Yeah. And then this is going to go to the public as well yeah. for comments. And it may be that depending on the budget, we might have to cut some things anyway. So we might get your mm -hmm. way. But so what if we make sure that if they can somehow, yeah. uh, you know, when you put the pricing together to have that specific thing as a separate line item. And then can I sure. ask, because if we're thinking about this being potentially a good area for students to use for educational program, is there any accessibility issues for students that might be in wheelchairs or seniors that might be using walkers, that sort of thing? There's a yeah, like ADA compliance. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, so at this point, there is no accessible route down to the beach in this area of the point. So, or access even the bench style seating. You can get to the top bench from the grass side and get onto the bench. You'd be able to transition onto that top bench 
um, from the lawn side. Yeah. Oh, so you can like sit. Right, right. So and back out to 50,000 feet, the strategy to pull this all back and get it out of uh, the domain of uh, deep, I think mm -hmm. um, is a good one and one that's, that we should be pursuing. I think that's that's the right way to go. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah. safe too, for the yeah. public. I really do. I was, I think I was with Austin on just being a little nervous about the slippery rocks and, you know. Well, that was underwater last week. <laughs> this let's, I mean, let's, let's yeah, face it. Not, not, yeah, it was close. Top step wasn't underwater, but the bottom step was. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure that there will be a problem at one point at the bottom level, but not as the other one was cascading into the water yeah. tide. It was going to be definitely, which we loved, because you would sit there and have the water coming at you. But, yeah. you know, the slippery piece, that's, a, I think, a very good observation. Um, okay, so we will we'll make sure that we get pricing, blocking out everything, but we could take this design to the public information session then. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank okay. You. So I think we just have one uh, last item on the communication facilities. And um, this is to update you on some of the issues going on with um, our. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I heard is Dean on that committee? No. Okay. I, okay. Um, all right. Um, so uh, I guess uh, I don't know. It, Sam is here. Was Chief Drum going to join this as well, or I'm not sure. I, I wonder if he didn't. <clears throat> I can't. I can't start my video. But I'm sorry. Okay. You know what? I think that might be a setting on the meeting. So uh, I know it's been a long night. I'll make this quick. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, um, so I, I put a couple uh, slides together that basically show where our, all our cell towers are. Uh, the first is a list that's off the assessor's list. Um, we have like six of them in town. Um, the next slide actually has the locations of them. Um, I know it's kind of busy, but um, so the, the circles are a one mile radius and a four mile radius. And that's because the 5G has a range of one to three miles and the 4G has a range of two to four miles. And it all de depends on topography. You see that little, that red dot up towards about the middle of the town, north and south? That's yeah. where Ryerson is. So you can see a lot of the lines intersect at that point, and that's probably why there's no signal up there. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, um, so so depending on, so, so you would think that along the beach we'd have plenty of coverage, but there must be. Uh, I don't know what the I don't know what the, the issue is. I don't know if it's just five G that we're pushing down there. Um, but the next slide has a, kind of uh, depicts what's going on on the uh, shoreline. And, and that's a one mile radius. And you can see where the gaps are on a one mile radius. Um, and it's pretty much in the areas where we're having problems. Right. Um, so we did, we did meet with Chief Drum and I met with the representative from American Tower last week. And we went around to a few sites for the viability of building some towers. One was at the public works garage. One was down at the upper parking lot at the exchange field. And both of those were, they said were very easy to build. It'd be uh, very little impact. Um, the one at the beach, you know, they said they would do a tree. They're a little bit more expensive. Um, they'd rather not do it, but if that's what the community wants, they would entertain putting a, a tree type tower up so it would blend in better. Um, and we also visited Ryerson School and the guy got very nervous. He goes, we shy away from school areas. I said, well, this school is going to be decommissioned within the next couple of years. So then he was kind of more comfortable with it. Um, then we went all the way up to Rockland Preserve, which is a little bit more complex to put a tower up there. But 
he was going to take all the sites back that are salespeople and um, get a feeling on, you know, from the carriers if there's a need, and then they might reach back out to us. Um, the one at the Public Works is um, would be in lieu of the tower that's at 8 Old Route 79 right now because um, they're having trouble with the landlord setting up a, a lease arrangement. And so they might just, they'd rather keep that tower there, but in case everything falls apart, there's another spot to build uh, the yeah, tower. Just, just so the board, we talked a little bit about how we're going to talk to the owners of that tower and um, uh, of the land, you know, and to, to have some sort of revenue. But it just, it, it got very more prominent. And then American Tower, who is the one that owns that tower, um, there now is, is contemplating moving to a So, um, so that's what kind of kind of start having the conversation. Well, see town and that it can serve multiple, multiple you know, purposes. Um, and so that's when we get around the one. Like, in my yard, if it means I get a cell signal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, so at all the spots, they were amenable to putting our public safety radio equipment up at the top, which would actually enhance our, our system as well. We do have a few dead spots, um, mostly up above in the county road area. But there is one spot um, where the Parkview Business Center is over there at 1291. The, the radio signal on all the frequencies just doesn't penetrate that building. It's very scratchy. Even even on the outside, uh, um, so some of these places would would enhance the radio system as well. Um, so what we were thinking of doing is put an RFP out after July one, have a consultant do a study for both, you know, the cell tower and our, our <clears throat> uh, emergency radio equipment to do you know like a feasibility where the best locations would be and where we could, where we would spend our, our best dollars. And that would be, we wanted to use the communications fund in CIP for that, correct? Yes. Pay for the consultant. So, yeah. um, you know, just doing, and this was a strategic plan objective, right? Was to improve public infrastructure, um, communications. Um, so I think it would be worth doing it, having somebody really look at, you know, where the problems are. And then, you know, would be the best served. Um, you know, there might be two of them. I know that I know the exchange field would be create a big improvement. You know, but that's now putting it on. I love the way it's most. When I have a tower there. I thought the um, light poles were built. So uh, we've talked about this, but I think that the. The company the, was a Verizon looked at this. I know the chief is not here, and I just think they found it wasn't um, going to do enough. You know what I mean? Like they, they do it for the yeah, basically for them, they're not going to get you know why do it? It's, it's it's only extending, but it's not going to be the same as actually. So we'll all switch to AT and T. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sam, when you look around with them, did you talk about that, the whole light pole thing at the uh, Strong Field? So that didn't come up because the guy that came out was just a tower company guy. Um, okay. What we really need to do is get the carriers out and see yeah. if they would put, put their equipment on it. Well, I thought Jack had done that with them, but I, I, it's unclear to me kind of what the conclusion was that it was they didn't seem interested is what he seemed to in, intimate. But well, the, <clears throat> Well, I don't think it was the cost benefit was on their side. I don't, you know, I don't think they were going to get enough boost out of their area for the cost of the adding all the equipment. Right. Okay. Um, so I think the, the, the idea here is if we could get the study, I mean, right now you would be looking at using CNP funds. Um, I might try to find a source so we can do this rather than wait. All right. Or I guess by the time we get the RFP together and for July one start, maybe. Yeah, I was wondering if there's any money in Scrog. 
I didn't even, I forgot to bring that up today. We were talking about it. I missed that too. So we'll come back with the timeline and up on this presentation. But because it looks like the whole tower arrangement that we had talked about, which didn't, wouldn't have solved any of these other problems. It just would have meant we would have secured the tower that had our communication stuff on it. So, okay. So that was kind of. Yeah, and in 2025, we're going to lose all the revenue that we're getting now off that tower at 879. Which is why doing something at, you know, the public works garage or whatever. I'm just thinking, too, uh, Ron Clark, this was his job with cell phone towers and whatnot. And he's done a lot of different companies and everything. Well, I follow the song. I haven't seen this song. Entered into the conversation at all. Okay. That's what I used to do. So, but we have talked to him. Okay. All right. Okay, so I think then the last item on the agenda is um, you're hanging in here. <laughs> you're not, you're not nice plan, right? Okay, but this is just a quick uh, business item. Um, item number 13 is listen to take action to approve calling a public hearing on Tuesday, February 27th, 2024, at 7 p.m. in the auditorium, Pulsing Middle School, 302 Green Hill Road, for the purpose of a budget presentation by the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Education. Conducted by the Board of Finance, in accordance with the town charter. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. That's just a business item, so we get that formally scheduled, and we'll get the notice in the paper. And any citizens' comments? Do we have anybody left? There are two people left, and their hands are not raised. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Great. With that, oh. hearing no objection.